Chapter 2.2 Things are simpler for vegetables, mused Bukka. You have your roots, so you know your place. You grow, and you serve your purpose by propagating and then being consumed. But we are rootless and we don't want to be eaten. So how are we supposed to live? What is a human life? What's a good life and what isn't? Who and what are these thousands we have just brought into being? The question of origins, Hukka said gravely, we must leave to the gods. The question we must answer is this one, now that we find ourselves here, and they. Our seed people, are down there, how shall we live? If we were philosophers, Bukka said, we could answer such questions, philosophically. But we are poor cowherds only, who became unsuccessful soldiers, and have suddenly somehow risen above our station. So we had better just get down there and begin, and find out the answers, by being there and seeing how things work out. An army is a question, and the answer to the question of the army is to fight. A cow is a question too, and the answer to the question of the cow is to milk it. Down there is a city that appeared out of nowhere, and that's a bigger question than we have ever been asked. And so maybe the answer to the question of the city is to live in it. Also, Hukka said, we should get on with that before our brothers arrive and try to steal a march on us. But still, as if dazed, the two brothers remained on the hill, immobile, watching the movement of the new people in the streets of the new city below them, and often shaking their heads in disbelief. It was as if they feared going down into those streets. Afraid that the whole thing was some sort of hallucination, and that if they entered it the deception would be revealed, the vision would dissolve, and they would return to the previous nothingness of their lives. Perhaps their stunned condition explained why they did not notice that the people in the new streets, and in the army camp beyond, were behaving peculiarly, as if they, too, had been driven a little crazy by their incomprehension of their own sudden existence, and were incapable of dealing with the fact of having been brought into being out of nowhere. There was a good deal of shouting, and of crying, and some of the people were rolling on the ground and kicking their legs in the air, punching the air as if to say, where am I, let me out of here. In the fruit and vegetable market people were throwing produce at one another, and it was unclear if they were playing or expressing their inarticulate rage. In fact they seemed incapable of expressing what they truly wanted, food, or shelter, or someone to explain the world to them and make them feel safe in it, someone whose soft words could grant them the happy illusion of understanding what they could not understand. The fights in the army camp, where the new people carried weapons, were more dangerous, and there were injuries. The sun was already diving toward the horizon when Hukka and Bukka finally made their way down the rocky hill. As evening shadows crawled across the many enigmatic boulders that crowded around their path it seemed to them both that the stones were acquiring human faces, with hollow eyes which were examining them closely, as if to ask, what, are these unimpressive individuals the ones who brought a whole city to life? Hukka, who was already putting on royal airs like a boy trying on the new birthday clothes his parents had left at the foot of his bed while he slept, chose to ignore the staring stones but Bukka grew afraid, because the stones didn't seem to be their friends, and could easily start an avalanche that would bury the two brothers forever, before they were able to step into their glorious future. The new city was surrounded by rocky hillsides of this sort, except along the riverbank. And all the boulders on all the hills now seemed to have become giant heads, whose faces wore hostile frowns, and whose mouths were on the verge of speech. They never spoke, but Bukka made a note. We are surrounded by enemies, he told himself. And if we are not quick to defend ourselves against them, they will thunder down upon us and crew SHS to bits. Aloud he said to his brother the king, you know what this city doesn't have, and needs as soon as possible? Walls. High, thick walls, strong enough to withstand any attack. Hukka nodded his assent. Build them, he said. Then they entered the city and, as night fell, found themselves at the dawn of time, and in the midst of the chaos which is the first condition of all new universes. By now many of their new progeny had fallen asleep, in the street. On the doorstep of the palace, in the shadow of the temple, everywhere. There was also a rank odor in the air, because hundreds of the citizens had fouled their garments. 
Those who were not asleep were like sleepwalkers, empty people with empty eyes, walking the streets like automata. Buying fruit at the fruit stalls without knowing what they were putting in their baskets, or selling the fruits without knowing what they were called, or, at the stalls offering religious paraphernalia, buying and selling enamel eyes, pink and white with black irises. Selling and buying these and many other trinkets to be used in the temple's daily devotions, without knowing which deities liked to receive what offerings, or why. It was night now, but even in the darkness, the sleepwalkers continued buying, selling, roaming the confused streets. And their glazed presences were even more alarming than the stinking sleepers. The new king, Hukka, was dismayed at the condition of his subjects. It looks like that which has given us a kingdom of subhumans, he cried. These people are as brainless as cows. And they don't even have udders to give us milk. Bukka, the more imaginative of the two brothers, put a consoling hand on Hukka's shoulder. Calm down, he said. Even human babies take some time to emerge from their mothers and start breathing air. And when they emerge, they have no idea what to do, and so they cry, they laugh, they piss and shit, and they wait for their parents to take care of everything. I think what's happening here is that our city is still in the process of being born, and all these people, including all the grown-ups, are babies right now, and we just have to hope that they grow up fast, because we don't have mothers to care for them. And if you're right, what are we supposed to do with this half-born crowd? Hukka wanted to know. We wait, Bukka told him, having no better idea to offer. This is the first lesson of your new kingship, patience. We must allow our new citizens, our new subjects, to become real, to grow into their newly created selves. Do they even know their names? Where do they think they came from? It's a problem. Maybe they will change quickly. Maybe by the morning, they will have become men and women and we can talk about everything. Until then, there's nothing to be done. The full moon burst out of the sky like a descending angel and bathed the new world in milky light. And on that moon-blessed night at the beginning of the beginning the Sangama brothers understood that the act of creation was only the first of many necessary acts, that even the powerful magic of the seeds could not provide everything that was needed. They themselves were exhausted, worn out by everything they had wrought and so they made their way into the palace. Here different rules seemed to apply. As they approached the arched gate into the first courtyard they saw a full complement of servitors standing before them like statues. Equerries and grooms frozen beside their immobile horses, musicians on a stage leaning into their silent instruments, and any number of household servants and aides, dressed in such finery as was appropriate for those who served a king, cockaded turbans, brocaded coats, Shoes that curled up at their pointed toes, necklaces, and rings. No sooner had Hukka and Bukka passed through the gate than the scene sprang to life, and all was bustle and hum. Courtiers rushed forward to escort them, and these were not the big babies of the city streets. But grown men and women, well-spoken and knowledgeable, and fully competent to carry out their duties. A flunky approached Hukka, carrying a crown on a red velvet cushion and Hukka set it happily on his head, noting that it was a perfect fit. He received the service of the palace staff as if it was his right and his due, but Bukka, walking a step or two behind him, had other thoughts. Looks like even the magic seeds have one rule for the rulers and another for the ruled, he reflected. But if the ruled continue to be unruly it won't be easy to rule them. The bedroom suites were so lavishly appointed that the question of who slept where was resolved without much discussion. And there were lords of the bedchamber to bring them their nightgowns and show them the wardrobes filled with royal garments appropriate to their stature. But they were too tired to take in much about their new home or to be interested in concubines. And within moments they were both fast asleep. In the morning things were different. How is the city today? Hukka asked the courtier, who came into his bedroom, to draw back the curtains. This individual turned and bowed deeply. Perfect, as always, sire, he replied. The city thrives under your majesty's rule, today and every day.